A little while back, I was put in a situation where I was up on a roof and asked to diagnose, I think it was a 40 ton rooftop unit up to this point. I'd never worked on commercial equipment before, but I was able to successfully get this unit up and running. I'm gonna try to share with you guys the principles that I lead upon to help me through that situation, even though I lacked some experience. I grabbed a bunch of random parts off the shelf here. Each one of these parts has its own schematic. We're gonna go through the part and the schematic, perform a couple of basic diagnostic tests on that part and we're going to start wiring them all together each one of these individual schematics start combining those together for what will ultimately be this frankenstein system nobody's ever seen before even though this system is a one of a kind you can still walk up and perform diagnostics on this thing let's get started so we're going to start off really simple here we're going to work our way up in complexity and get pretty creative as this goes but to begin we always have power coming into our schematic from somewhere the breaker panel and we're gonna do that today with this power cord. We have our black wire that is our line voltage on a schematic that will be labeled as L1. We have a white wire here that is our neutral on a schematic that will be labeled with the letter N. And we have a green wire here, which is our ground. Now this schematic is gonna have some kind of a shutoff or a disconnect so that we can manually isolate power from the unit. And we're gonna do that today with the regular light switch. Now there's a couple different tests you might perform on a switch like this. Uh, one would be to see if you actually have voltage present. One would be to see if you actually have a lack of voltage, say you wanna work on it, you don't wanna get electrocuted. And the other test would just be to see if the switch itself actually works. Now there's two tests you could do that. Um, you can either test for ohms, uh, which is resistance, or you can check for continuity. When we're testing for ohms, we're gonna take our multimeter, we are gonna to go to the 200 ohm reading right here. And we are going to take our probes, go to each terminal here. Now, when the switch is in the off position, we will read OL on our meter. So basically what that means is an open line. All right, we have essentially an infinite amount of resistance between these two points. So there's no way for electricity to actually travel through. Now, when we turn the switch on and put our both row probes here, what we're reading here is about 1.6 ohms. So we have a little bit of resistance there, which is what we want. You're not gonna read a whole lot of resistance on simple switches like this. Now, a continuity test, we put our meter on that little circle with the sound waves on it. And on a closed switch, we will actually get a beep. And you can see we have continuity here. We open our switch and we lose it. So that's telling me the switch is functional. Now we're gonna connect these two parts together. We're gonna to take our little individual schematics and jam them together. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our black wire, our line voltage, and put it into one side of the switch. Now we have voltage coming into the switch. We need to send that voltage back out again to whatever first device we're gonna have in this sequence. So let's go ahead and run another wire on the other side of the switch. Now we have power coming into the switch and power coming out. Now in electrical, this is called line and load. Our line is the power coming from our breakers. The load is the power going to the actual unit itself. Let's go ahead and put this switch into a 1900 box. Now we're just going to take both of our neutrals coming in and going back out and we're going to wire them straight together. So now we're just going to connect all these grounds and ground it to the metal box. Tuck it in all nice and neat. We're going to go ahead and put a faceplate on it and now we're ready to move on to our next device. Now, on most systems at this point, the power coming in is going to split off and go a couple different places. And the reason why is because we need high voltage to carry on to run our big ticket items. So we're talking about pumps, compressors, uh, motors, things of that nature. We also need a separate circuit for our control circuit. So it's going to be usually a low voltage control circuit. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a splice here. We're going to have one wire that we're going to connect that will carry on and carry the 120 volts that we need for our pumps and motors and whatever else we're going to wire in here. And then we're going to connect a transformer. And that transformer is going to take the same 120 volts coming in and step it down to our low voltage control circuit. Now, typically in a diagnostic situation, you're pretty much going to be doing voltage tests on a transformer that you suspect might be bad. So you're either going to check for 120 volts coming in by going to your line in neutral, or you're going to check for 24 volts coming out by putting each probe on each one of these terminals just to see what you have. Um, if you do not have power coming in, 
uh, your problems somewhere before that. If you don't have power coming out, but you do have power coming in, you probably have a burnt out transformer. You can also do a resistance or a continuity reading on the uh, primary and secondary coils in this thing. But typically at that point, you're kind of just confirming what you already know. But if you do a continuity or resistance reading and you're reading open line, you pretty much have a blown transformer. So let's go ahead and we're going to take our wire that's gonna carry the high voltage to our motors. And we're gonna take the black wire that is gonna to convert to our low voltage circuit. And we're just gonna wire nut those together. And then we will take the neutral from our transformer, go back to neutral that goes back to our switch and to the electrical panel. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna bring in an inducer draft motor. Um, now. If we wire this straight into the power coming off, as soon as we turn our power on, that draft motor is going to run nonstop continuously. It's never gonna shut off. So we need to interrupt the circuit coming uh, between our 120 coming in and the wire going straight to our motor. We need something in between so we could shut this circuit on and off. So most of the time, that's gonna be a relay of some kind. Today, we're gonna to use a 9340 relay. So when we look at this schematic of a relay, um, what we're gonna see here on our right side are four terminals, and each pair of these terminals connects to a winding. So we have a copper winding here under this white wrapper, it goes around and around and around and around, and when this terminal is energized, it will send electricity through that, create a magnetic field. Now, the other six terminals we have on here, on the left side, we have terminals one, two, and three. That is for one switch. And we have terminals four, five, and six. That is for a second switch. So this relay has two switches in it. Not all relays have two. Some might just have one. Now, the way this works, if I were to bring in, here's my power coming in from my switch, I'm gonna put that on terminal one. Now, from here, we have two options on how we could set this up. From terminals one to two, you can see on the schematic, it says normally closed. So what that means is this relay in its state right now with no wires connect to it straight out of the box, the switch between one and two is closed. So I don't need to energize this. I don't need to do anything to put that switch in that position. The terminals between one and three are open right now. So I would have to energize this coil, create a magnetic field and move that switch from one to two to one to three for me to get power moving from one to three and moving on. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We want our motor to be in the off position until we decide to turn it on. So we're gonna bring our power coming in from our switch onto terminal one of this relay. And then we're gonna take the power wire going to our motor off of terminal three. We're also going to have to bring our neutral from our motor back to our neutral wires going back to the switch and the panel. So we'll go ahead and wire that in as well. So now we have to activate this relay in order to turn this motor on. And we're going to do that with the low voltage circuit coming off our transformer. So what we need now is some kind of a control that decides when to turn that motor on and off. And I decided today we're going to get a little crazy and use a humidistat. Now a humidistat is pretty much no different than a switch over here. It's just two terminals. It's on or off. Um, the only difference is instead of a switch like that, you have a dial. Now, I don't know if you guys can hear this. That's the switch opening and closing as I turn the dial past a certain set point. So this is reading humidity level and we're gonna turn our inducer motor on and off with that. So in order to hook up our humidistat, what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a red wire from the load on our transformer to one terminal on the humidistat here. You can see we have two terminals right here. So we'll run the red wire from there to there. We will now run another red wire from the other switch on our humidistat to the coil on our relay so that we can power it and activate that switch. So let's hook that up. And now we're going to wire from the other side of this coil back to common on our transformer to complete the humidistat circuit. So we'll use a blue wire for that one and hook that up. All right, so now I have my power plugged in. Let's go ahead and turn our power on our switch. So right now we should have power going up to the number one terminal on our relay and it should stop right there 
We also have power going to our transformer and we should have 24 volts. So let's take our multimeter out, check and see if that's what we got. We're gonna put it to volts AC. Okay. And I'm going to test from one terminal to the other to see what we got. We are reading about 30 volts. So that confirms that I have high voltage going to my transformer. My transformer is doing what it's supposed to do and it's giving me a low voltage control signal. I can also test to see if I have power on terminal one. I'm just gonna go from one to three and I'm reading 125 volts there. So that is an open switch right now, which is why I'm reading 125. Once that switch closes, I would read zero if I did that same test with the same probes on the same spot. So let's go ahead and turn on our computer stat and see if our inducer motor comes on. Well, it works exactly as designed so far. So let's move on and add something else. So I have a pressure switch here for this draft motor. So I went ahead and I hooked the hose up to that. Now you're not going to see a hose on a schematic, but we do have a switch now on this pressure switch that we can use to turn another circuit on and off. So when it comes to testing pressure switches, basically what you're doing is you want to determine if the switch is in an open or closed position um, and then try to determine if that is the correct position at the time it's supposed to be open or closed. So right now without that inducer fan running, this switch should be open. So if I wanted to do a continuity test, put my probes on each one of these terminals, I should not read any continuity because that switch is open. Uh, same thing for if I did a resistance reading, I should read an open line. And that's what I'm seeing on my meter. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna turn this thing on. The draft from the motor will pull the diaphragm in and close this switch. And at that point, I should have continuity. So we'll go ahead and go back to our continuity on our meter. We will go ahead and turn our power on, turn on our humidistat. And I am now reading continuity. Now sometimes you might want to test the pressure switch with the wiring hooked up um, and voltage present. So in order to do that, we would just do a voltage reading on each terminal individually to see what we have to determine whether the switch is open or closed. So for example, we would put our multimeter in the voltage AC position and we would test each uh, terminal individually. So I might go from one terminal to a ground or a common on a transformer or some other source. And then I would see if I have 24 volts there. If I do, I'll go test the other terminal. Now, if I'm reading zero volts on the other terminal, that means I have an open switch. If I'm reading 24 volts on both terminals, that means I have a closed switch. Another test you can perform is put both of your probes on both terminals at the same time. Um, and in this case, if you're reading 24 volts, you have an open switch. And if you have a closed switch, you should be reading zero volts. And the reason for this is, is a multimeter actually measures a difference in potential. So if you have voltage on both of these terminals, what's the difference between 30 volts on one side and 30 volts on the other? It's zero. You know, so you're going to read zero volts on your meter on a closed switch, even though you actually have 30 volts there. On an open switch, you have 30 volts on one side and zero volts on the other. What is the difference there? 30 volts. So you will read 30 volts when you put both probes there on an open switch. So it is important to understand how a multimeter actually works so that you can get the correct readings and not misdiagnose things and end up replacing parts that you think are bad, but they're not. All right, so now we're ready to wire in another circuit that we can control some other device with, with this switch. So what we're gonna do is I have a couple of options here. Um, 
I could bring power in directly from the secondary side of my transformer so that there will always be 24 volts present at this switch until I need it or I can take 24 volts off the coil on this relay. In that case, if I take energy from there and put it to my pressure switch, I will only have 24 volts here when my humidistat switch is closed. So we're gonna go that route. We're gonna take the power off the coil to the pressure switch so that we only have 24 volts there when the humidistat is doing its thing. So we're gonna use a red wire for that and we'll go ahead and put that in. So what we have now is when our humidistat closes, it'll energize this coil, the inducer draft motor will start, the pressure switch will close and the 24 volts available from the coil will be able to flow through the switch. So now let's take our power from the other side of this switch and let's turn something on with that. Let's use a Honeywell zone valve. So these zone valves, they have four wires on them. The two yellow wires is the circuit that actually powers a motor here. Now this motor has a lever on the back side of it and when that lever opens all the way, it pushes in this little black button below it. And that is a switch called an end switch and that closes the circuit on these two red wires here. So we have two different circuits here, one that powers the motor and one that works off of a switch that the motor closes when it's fully open. Now diagnosing these things, uh, you pretty much just wanna make sure you have voltage coming to your motor. It's gonna be low voltage, so you're looking for around 24 to 28 volts somewhere in that ballpark. You also wanna confirm that the motor is pushing in that switch all the way. Um, sometimes a motor gets jammed, uh, it doesn't work properly even when it's getting power and it doesn't actually push in that end switch. One way to determine if your motor is actually running or not is this lever on top, this manual lever, it'll be very loose. It'll wiggle back and forth. There won't be any tension on it. When the motor is not powered, there will be tension on this and as you can see, that switch just kind of goes back right on its own. When a motor is powered and fully open, that switch will not go back like that. It'll just stay loose. The end switch side, um, this is something you can do a continuity test on or a resistance reading. If we were to take our multimeter, put it to continuity, and I put my probes on each one of these wires. When I push in that little black button, I should have continuity on it. So we'll do that with a screwdriver and our switch is working. Let's go ahead and let's wire this into our circuit. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of the yellow wires for the motor and we're gonna take it right off the other side of the pressure switch so that when the pressure switch closes, the 24 volts from our transformer will then energize this motor. The other yellow wire is like our common and we're just gonna bring that right back to common on our transformer. So here's our pressure switch here. We have our red wire coming in from the coil on our relay. When that switch closes, our yellow wire going to our zone valve will be energized. And the other yellow wire brings us back to common on our transformer and I used a white wire for that. So now we have our power circuit all put in for the motor on our zone valve and it will be activated and powered up once that switch closes. So when that switch closes, this motor should operate. All right, so now we're ready to hook up something else to this circuit here. Uh, we do need to bring in power for this circuit from somewhere. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hook up a second transformer here. Because we don't wanna take too much power off of one transformer when we already have a relay coil in there. Uh, we already have a motor on there, so we don't want to keep adding stuff and overload this because then we're going to have parts that aren't going to start working because they're just not getting enough power. So here's our second transformer here. We're going to hook these black and white wires up to the same black and white wires that are feeding this transformer over here. So we're going to be splitting off again from that 110 volts coming in from our switch and using the neutral going right back through the switch and back to the breaker panel. All right, so now we have that second transformer in our system. We're ready to take power off of that and then put it into one end of our end switch circuit here. We're gonna go ahead and use a red wire for that. 
now we have power ready to go on one side of this end switch circuit so that when the end switch closes, this circuit gets powered up and we could activate something else with that. So let's use a contactor. Now a contactor works very similar to the relay. Uh, we have a low voltage connections on both sides here that activates a coil that creates a magnetic field. And when that coil is energized, these plungers pull in and they allow high voltage to travel through the contactor. So when you're testing contactors, uh, there's a couple of different things you could test. Uh, usually you want to test to see if you're actually getting a 24 volt signal on, in on one side to actually activate the coil and pull the plungers in. Um, you can test for resistance between each side of these coils. And when you're testing for ohms on these coils, you're going to get a higher reading than you would on just like a regular on and off switch like we did before. So if I were to take my multimeter, I put it into the ohm position and I would test both sides of this coil and I'm reading about 12.4 ohms. Now a lot of people ask what is a normal reading for this. Uh, you ask 10 different technicians, you're probably going to get 10 different answers. But what we're looking for is usually between 10 and 30. It could vary anywhere in between there. Um, if you're really low at like 5 or 6 on a contactor like this, uh, it's probably getting weak. If you're reading really high, like up, upper 30s, 40 plus, uh, that's not a good sign either. So our coil is pretty good. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the power that will go through our end switch when it closes to power one side of this coil. And now what we need to do is we need to bring this circuit back to common on a transformer so that we can have a full circuit here. So we will run a white wire from the other side of this coil back to common on our transformer. All right, so now that we have a complete circuit and our end switch circuit, let's go ahead and turn on and let's just see if this contactor pulls in and everything works up to this point. So that pressure switch should be closed right now. The motor should be spinning. It will eventually hit that end switch and our contactor should pull in. There we go. Now I could just keep going with this, just keep adding parts in, but our schematic's getting a little hectic. Our wirings get a little crazy. Uh, you can see I already changed my clothes because I've been on this for a couple days already for you guys. So what we're going to do now instead is we're going to go ahead and create a problem in our system here. And we're going to use the schematic and our multimeter to kind of figure out where it is. All right, so here's our whole system kind of crowded in here. I'm going to go ahead and turn the power on. And we're going to activate our humidistat so we can get things going. All right, so so far what we know is that we definitely have power going to our transformer. We definitely have power going to our relay because our inducer fan motor is running. If we, weren't, if we didn't have power there, we wouldn't have this motor running right now. So what we have to determine is why everything seems to be stopping there. Uh, my zone valve motor's not working, my contactor's not pulling in. So if we know the fan motor's running right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see if I actually have voltage coming up to this pressure switch. So I'm gonna take my multimeter, I'm gonna put it in voltage AC, and I'm gonna go ahead, I am to test the power wire coming in from our transformer. I'm gonna test the power coming in from my relay that should be going to this valve. So I'm gonna test on that one terminal, go back to common on my transformer, and I'm reading 27 volts there. So I know I have power coming to my pressure switch. Let's see if I have power on the other side of it. So I'm gonna do the same test, go to common on my transformer in the other terminal, and I don't have any voltage there. So I can do another type of test here. I could just put both of my probes on both of these terminals and I'm reading 27 volts there. So if you remember what I said earlier, if I'm reading 20, a difference of 27 volts between one terminal and the other, that means I have an open switch. I should be reading zero volts there if that switch is closed. So what I know now is that there's something wrong with either the diaphragm in there or the hose that is supposed to pull it in is clogged or something along those lines. So let's go ahead and inspect everything. 
and there's your problem right there. The hose is disconnected. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to push it back in. I'm going to test for voltage across both terminals and now I'm reading zero volts. That means my switch is closed. My zone valve motor should be operating and my contactor is pulled in. So as you guys can see, once you have a fundamental understanding of how parts work, how to trace out a schematic to see how power flows through these parts, um, how to use a multimeter to test these parts, and when to figure out when these parts should be on or off or switches opened and closed, um, you have a lot of the information you need to really start weeding out problems, even if you may not be completely familiar with the system and don't have years and years of experience. So with that said, uh, if you guys want to help me uh, spread the word here so that this information can get out to more people like you who are looking for it, uh, you basically got to interact with the video somehow. Personally, I don't care, but if YouTube doesn't see people interact, it doesn't show it to more people. So if you want to spread the wealth, help out your brothers and sisters in HVAC, they interact with the video some way, somehow. And with that said, I'm Jersey Mike, and for like the five of you still watching, thank you so much.